Good evening, everybody. I'm Moss Bresnahan. I'm the executive director of Illinois Public Media, and I'd like to welcome you to this very special event as part of our year-long celebration of Will's 100th anniversary. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Judy Woodruff to the celebration. I've been a fan of PBS NewsHour for four decades now, back when it was the McNeil Lair NewsHour, and I think PBS NewsHour just sets the gold standard for viewers like you who prefer substance over sound bites and illumination over confrontation. Every night, tens of thousands of people turn to WILL for the solid, reliable, reliable reporting that has made the PBS NewsHour one of the most trusted news programs in television. Anchored by managing editor Judy Woodruff, the NewsHour features the latest news, analysis, field reports from around the world, live studio interviews and discussions. And that's one of the reasons why year after year, polls have shown that PBS is the most trusted news brand of them all. Millions of Americans all across the ideological and political spectrum trust PBS reporting of news and public affairs ahead of any other media organization in the country. And one of the reasons for that is our special guest tonight. Judy is a broadcast pioneer who has covered politics and other news for more than three decades at CNN, NBC, and PBS. She's the recipient of too many awards to list here, but a few include the Peabody's Journalistic Integrity Award, the Pointer Medal for Lifetime Achievement in Journalism, the Gwen Eiffel Press Freedom Award, and the Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism. And she's the recipient of more than 25 honorary degrees. And I have to add that Judy has always been so generous with her time and talents when it comes to spending time with local PBS stations uh, and their donors. I was delighted to spend time with Judy and Peoria about uh, five or six years ago now, and really happy for this uh, virtual return to, to Illinois tonight. Before I turn it over to Brian Mackey and Judy, just a quick word about our 100th anniversary celebration. WILL's roots go back to the earliest days of broadcasting in America, when innovators at the University of Illinois wanted to experiment with this brand new technology called radio. And in 1922, at the height of prohibition and Warren G. Harding was president, they fired up our first fragile vacuum tube transmitter for the very first time. And our AM station was among the country's very first public radio stations. And in fact, we preceded the BBC by six months. Those who are working at the university's electrical engineering lab back there saw the potential for this new technology and what it could mean for the area's citizenry. WILO was founded on a very progressive concept that all Illinoisans deserve an educational service that informs, involves, and inspires. And that concept has endured and evolved over the past 100 years, growing into what we know it to be today, an important part of the health of our democracy, a place to share vital information about our region and economy, and a way to present the best that our culture has to offer. And over the course of WILL's history, we've transformed communities and strengthened the lives of millions of people. While the landscape has changed dramatically over the last 100 years, Illinois public media's mission has not, and it's more important now than ever. So as we look to the next 100 years, we know we'll have to continue to evolve, but we also believe the power of local public media will remain vital. So I'd like to thank all of you who have joined us tonight, who are already friends of WILL. Thank you for your support. And I hope you'll continue that support so that we can make the next 100 years even better. So now it's my pleasure to turn this over to Brian Mackey. <clears throat> Brian is the host of my favorite program on public radio, the 21st, heard Monday through Thursday on WILL and six other NPR stations across Illinois. He formerly reported on state government and politics for Public Radio in Illinois, and before that he was the arts editor at the State Journal Register and State House Bureau Chief for the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin. So thanks again to you all for being here. Thank you for your support of WILL. We couldn't do it without friends like you. And now I'll turn it over to our host Brian Mackey and Judy Woodruff. Thank you very much for that, Moss. And uh, from one state house, former state house reporter to another, uh, <laughs> it, it's a real thrill for me to be talking with Judy Woodruff. The Washington Post once uh, quoted you as saying, I love asking questions and hate answering them. So that's a sentiment <laughs> I share. So I want to begin by thanking you for making time to be with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, Brian, I just have to say to Moss, what a, what a treat it is to to see you and to celebrate with you 100 years of WILL. I mean, what a what a historic occasion and just so exciting to think about the history of how it started. I love hearing about the vacuum tube getting fired up way back in 1922. Um, but but what, a, what a great run you have had and you continue to have um, in the state of Illinois. And uh, you hold the banner high for public media. And I'm just, I'm just really, really glad to be with you and congratulations. Well, thank you for that on behalf of all of us here at WILL and in our WILL community. 
Um, I, I want to begin, though, on a, uh, a little bit more of a somber note tonight. We're, we're talking on March 30th, and I, I want to ask you to go back 41 years to the day. You're covering the White House. You and an NBC news, news crew are in a small pool of reporters who are traveling with the president as he gives a speech that afternoon. And you're standing about 40 feet away from President Reagan on this day, 41 years ago, when John Hinckley opens fire on him, Press Secretary James Brady, two law enforcement officers. You reported from the scene. You were soon on the air from the White House. Can you talk about what lessons you took from that experience? Well, thank you, Brian, for um, uh, reminding us that uh, of that sobering moment in American history when, you're right, John Hinckley, a young man, uh, brought a gun to the Washington Hilton Hotel. And when President Reagan uh, came out the door. Um, he shot at the president and also hit several other people. I was there that day, uh, Brian, because I was part of the pool. I was working for NBC News. I was the pool is a small uh, representative group of reporters and and camera and photographers, camera people and photographers who travel with the president when he moves around, either moves around the city or or travels by air or or however in a car um, and to, to be there, to be the eyes and ears of the American people. And I remember it vividly because we were, we were not allowed to ask him any questions inside. He was speaking to a, a labor group and he'd only been in office two months and he'd been inaugurated on January uh, the 20th, of course, just, and this was March the 30th, and just getting his feet on the ground as president of the United States, had, having been the governor of California for eight years, comes out the door and I'm shouting a question to him. I'm on the other side of the, the there was a, 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 a string of cars who there were there, the, the usual, they had the, the security, several security cars, and then they had the press vans, and then they had the president's limousine, and then more secret service and so on. So, but it's, but it's all in a, in a string of, I don't know, 10 or 12 cars. And I'm on the other side of where you, that iconic picture was, with a picture of, you know, the men who were down. I mean, they the photographer, in fact, who, who took that picture just, just died in the last few days. Um, but what happened was I was yelling a question about something going on in Poland. They were having uh, uh, protests. Their labor movement was having protests. I remember asking, I was just getting the words out of my mouth about Lech Walesa, who had been the leader of Poland's uh, solidarity movement. And when we heard this pop, pop, pop sound, and of course, first you think, oh, somebody's shooting firecrackers, but then of course they wouldn't be doing that near the president. People are screaming, get down, get down, which I did along with a few other press people who were around me. I was only about 20 feet from the, from the president's car on the other side uh, and uh, very quickly had to make a decision. Uh, the, the press aide for the White House yelled at us, make a decision, are you coming with us? Or are you gonna stay here? And of course, I mean, I thought about going with the president. I'm supposed to be with the president, it's my job, but there I could see people lying on the ground. I recognized Jim Brady, president's press secretary who had been gravely wounded uh, and two others, a policeman. And it uh, turned out I didn't know it at the time and a secret service agent. And, and, we, and I made the instant decision to stay there so that I could file. The cars, the motorcade pulled out uh, 60 miles an hour. They were out of there. And then I had to scramble to find a phone. You remember this is 1981. It's before the days of the cell phone. And all of us reporters had, you know, had scattered, began to scatter. Three or four ran into the Hilton Hotel. I looked in the door and no phone in the lobby was available. I ran across the street, got a phone in a federal office building just across the street, T Street from the Hilton and was on the phone with NBC to file for NBC radio. But uh, what was so, the hardest thing for me that day, Brian, was seeing Jim Brady. Um, somebody I knew, somebody I had covered, had gotten to know him, his wife, and to see him lying on the ground with what was clearly a very serious head, in, head wound, not knowing whether he was alive or not. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was very difficult. And also, frankly, not knowing if the president was all right. We assumed he was okay because he'd been pushed into a car, the motorcade had taken off. We had no way of knowing then that the motorcade would end up detouring on the way back to the White House. Everybody now knows the story. They were headed back to the White House when uh, the president, the Secret Service agent said, I think we just need to be um, careful. And I think, I think at that point, the president felt blood uh, on coming out of his shirt. So it, it was a moment that you never, ever prepare for. And you, you hope you'll never, ever see the likes of that again. 
and you are scrambling. You, you describe going across the street, phoning in to NBC radio. Then you call the Washington desk. You and your news crew have to commandeer a cab to get back to the White House. And then you spend the rest of the day on air. Um, can you talk about people you said even at the time? I, I read this in your, your 1983 book on your some of your early experiences reporting from Washington um, that people were remarked on your composure and your ability to just deliver the news as you had it coming in. And there's a lot of confusion that day. People might not remember, but conflicting reports about the president, conflicting reports about James Brady and his condition right. and what had happened to him. There were, there were reports, there were false reports made that uh, Jim Brady had been, Jim Brady had died, uh, that there were different reports, a lot of confusion about the president's condition because the White House wasn't saying where he was initially, they didn't say where he was, and eventually he said he was in the hospital, but there was no report on how he was doing. We were led to believe it was mild, but nobody was really sure. We didn't know until we were hours into this that the president, you know, had been hit in, where he was hit, you know, in the side, and that, um, and frankly, none of us knew for a long time afterwards how close he came to dying. I mean, we, of course, we learned much later that if the bullet had just been a fraction of an inch in a different direction, uh, it, it could have, you know, killed him. Um, I don't know. You asked me about composure. I don't know where that comes from. I think, um, again, I mean, at that point in my life, I'd been a reporter for all of eight years. <laughs> Uh, I started out in local uh, local news covering the, you mentioned you and Moss covered state capital. I covered the Georgia state capital. That was my first job and did that for five years um, uh, before I joined NBC. And um, I think we all knew that our job, we all know our job is serious. We're there to report, we're there to hit the facts. And that was what was driving me that day. But you're right, there was a lot of confusion and a lot of chaos, not only on our part, but on the part of the White House. You remember that was the day that uh, that Al Haig, who, uh, you know, was uh, at the White House and announced that he was in charge instead of the vice president, um, uh, vice president, then George Bush. So um, and then they had to clean that up. And, and there was just it was it was chaos. It was chaos. Of course, it all sorted it out in a matter of days. But you also remember the president stayed in the hospital for weeks. Um, and and there were a lot of uh, contradictory reports about how he was doing. I'm told my audio level was a little low. I don't know if this is any better, if you can hear it me. It is better. better. Okay, it was great. a little low, and I was waiting right. to say something, but I can hear you. <laughs> my, my apologies for that. Um, so let me ask, there's a way of looking at what happened that day in 1981 as the sort of coming at the end of a period of extraordinary public violence in America, going back to the Kennedy assassination, the other Kennedy assassination, Martin Luther King, the bombings throughout the 1970s, the weather underground, that sort of thing. It, it, Sometimes it feels like we're entering another era of public violence in America. Do you see a through line connecting those that time in America and, and where we are today? Well, I certainly hope that we're not entering another era where we have an assassination of a president as we did in 1963 and where we have attempted assassinations. Um, I mean, Gerald Ford um, had two experiences. Uh, for President Reagan, it was one and we know that every president receives threats. It's just, it comes with the job. Um, I certainly hope that we're not entering an era where our presidents are targeted um, openly. And, you know, we want to believe that the security is greater. Um, and we want to believe that people can work out their differences in a different way. But I think what you're touching on, Brian, is just how politically divided we are today, how, how viscerally polarized we are as a country. Um, I mean, I sometimes say I, I, for years and years, I've covered American politics and people have disagreed with each other. They felt free to express their differences. But today, it's not just, you're not just talking about people who disagree with you. They're people who consider you the enemy. They consider you not patriotic, not a good American. I mean, we've, we have crossed over a kind of a bridge in that regard uh, so that you're no longer my adversary, you're my enemy. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a difficult time in our country. As I said, I mean, I hope we're not heading into a period where our presidents are gonna be targeted as they were in the 60s and the 70s and then into the 80s, but, but um, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty brutal out there. And um, there's certainly, you know, when you think about what happened at the Capitol on January the 6th of last year, um, the fact that many of the people who went into the Capitol were armed, thank God, <laughs> No one used, uh, that there wasn't more 
uh, mayhem than there was. We know that one woman was shot by the police as she was uh, breaking in a door to get into the Capitol and she died. And there were other deaths of police. And we know some of the, some of the protesters, the rioters, uh, a couple of them died. Um, but it could have been much, much worse than it was. And, um, I, I, and to this day, as you know, the country remains divided over exactly what happened. There are people who continue to insist that these people who, who stormed the Capitol on January 6th were simply exercising their First Amendment rights and they had every right to be in a public building. Well, that's not exactly the case. We have the right to be there as long as it doesn't infringe on the work that's being done there um, by the United States Congress and by the members of Congress and particularly on that day when they were counting and certifying, not counting, but certifying the, the presidential election outcome. And so um, it, was, it, it was a sobering time. We are still in a sobering time. And uh, it, I, you know, frankly, Brian, it colors so much of what we cover in the city today. It's hard to think of an issue that the two sides have come together on. I'm thinking of the war in Ukraine. In a way, it has brought the two political parties together. There's generally agreement broad agreement, widespread agreement that the United States should be helping Ukrainian people as much as we can to fend off this terrible um, uh, and brutal war that the Russians have, uh, have started and are, are carrying out right now. Um, there is disagreement over tactics and how much and when and so forth, but in general, it's brought us together. We do tend to come together when there's a, when there's a crisis, um, but we are, we are clearly in a politically polarized time and um, I, I, you know, like so many Americans, I hope we can find a way through it, find our way through it and come out uh, better on the other side. I, f I feel like I've gotten this conversation off to a very dark start this evening. And uh, on that optimistic note, let, let's turn to talking a little more about the, the PBS NewsHour. You, you anchor a program. It was once called the McNeil Lehrer Report and then the NewsHour with Jim Lehrer. I have to imagine you could have bargained to have it called the News Hour with Judy Woodruff if you wanted to do that. But can you talk about the ethos of public broadcasting that cuts against that sort of branding that's so common now in, in news and television news in particular? Well, you know, I've never thought about that because by the time Gwen Eiffel and I um, were named the, uh, the, uh, the co-anchors, this is after Jim Lehrer had stopped. He basically stopped anchoring after 2011 and he named five of us as sort of rotating anchors and uh and then a couple about a year and a half two years after that he and robin mcneil who still at that point ran and and uh owned mcneil lara productions uh, uh announced that they wanted gwen and me to be the the sole anchors um of the the or i should say co-anchors of the program but by that time it was already the pbs news hour jim had had uh made sure of that. I think it was in 2010 when it became, I think this is right. I've got to go back and look at my history book. When it became the PBS News Hour, he took his name off the program. While he was after, still anchoring it, which he was is still anchoring early it. Had been, you're right. It had been the McNeil Air Report starting 1975 after the Watergate hearings. And he and Robin had very successfully uh, reported on those hearings, which the country had the country grip in the grips of, you know, what every day, the hearings on Capitol Hill and, and the developments uh, and of course, eventually leading to President Nixon's leaving office. So that was 1975. They start the, the half hour report. Eight years later, they have done so well that they uh, decide with the acquiescence of PBS stations across the country that they're going to expand to an hour. To do that, they went around the country and essentially lobbied the major PBS stations and said, please give us an extra half hour. And they did, you know, we're different. The PBS system is different from the commercial network system where there's kind of a central place. I mean, there is a central place in PBS uh, and it happens to be in, in, in the Washington area, but um, the stations just like WILL are the ones that make these decisions. Uh, after eight years, they went to an hour and that's when I joined the first time. That was 1983. Uh, they named it, renamed it the McNeil Lara News Hour. And then uh, 12 years later, Robin retired that was in 1995, and it became then the Jim, the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, and it was, remained that until, as I said, about maybe 2010. And then at that point, Jim was thinking about, you know, when he was going to exit, and he did lead at the end of 2011. So, no, it was the PBS News Hour, and my view has always been, you know, and Gwen and I used to talk about this. We are stewards of this program, and when we stop being part of this, we want to hand it off 
to the next team in very good shape. And, and that was always our goal. It puts me in line. I don't know if you're familiar with that old journalism movie, Deadline USA. Humphrey Bogart plays this crusading newspaper editor, and he has this line in there. A journalist makes himself the hero of the story. A reporter is only the witness. And I think that really embodies what I see the news hour trying to do. Can you talk about how you view your role in uh, the idea of journalism or a reporter? Our entire mission, I mean, the, the ethos of the news hour when I came there in, uh, from NBC, in 1983 was, was to be witness to the most important stories of the day to say, okay, we have an hour each night, five nights a week, Monday through Friday, to tell you what are the most important things that happened in the world that day, in our country, in the world, things that you need to know to make you a good citizen, things that you need to know that help you understand whether we're safe, you know, what are the national security challenges facing our country um, and the world, um, what are what are the issues we need to understand uh, as Americans? What's our government doing? How are we holding our public officials accountable? Um, all of those questions drive what we do every day. Um, and whether it's a, a set of health issues as we've been dealing with for the last two years with the COVID um, crisis, the pandemic, whether it is um, covering a war overseas right now in Ukraine, whether it's an assassination attempt on a president, whatever it is, uh, or whether it's just a typical day when there's no big headline, but it's a day for us to catch up on so many stories that we think you want to know about, whether it's um, just a, a report on education in this country, a report on taxes uh, in this country, a report on, and something that we're increasingly doing over the last many years, frankly, is the arts in this country. I mean, how are we, how are we doing? I mean, what are some of our writers saying to us about um, who we are as Americans right now and what our values are and what, what kind of art is being created, what kind of music. So all of that goes into the mix. And we try to think of a balanced diet of, of um, the kinds of news that we think people need to know and, and want to know, need, but basically need to know in order to, to function as, as citizens of this great country. Um, and, but we're witnesses, we're not there to tell you what to think or how to vote. We're there to give you the information and then you listen to that, you pay attention and you decide. Um, and we hope we are answering your questions every night. If we're not, we'll keep trying the next night. This approach, there, there has been, what you're talking about, it, it reminds me or raises in my mind this idea of discussions in media circles over whether news reporters can, can or should strive for objectivity in their news coverage. And the press thinker, Jay Rosen, for example, is critical of what he calls a, a view from nowhere style reporting. He says that drives down trust in the press and it would be better to say, here's where I'm coming from. So I guess my question to you is, where are you coming from every night when that red light goes on? Well, it's neither one of those um, polar uh, uh, ends that you just described. I don't think there's any such thing as objectivity in reporting. We're humans. I'm the sum total of all of my experiences. I'm a woman, I'm a grandmother, I'm a, a journalist for the last 40, 50 years of my, of my life. I've worked in Atlanta, I've worked in Washington. Um, I've mainly covered politics. I have a family, as I mentioned. All of that informs you know, who I am, but it's not going to color uh, my view of a particular story. It may, it will certainly affect the stories that I think are important for us to tell. Uh, and a good example of that is, you know, today, I just think we're doing a much better job of covering all of America. There was a time when we really only covered white men in America, you know, and then we eventually were covering white men and women. And today, I think we're doing, we're not perfect yet by any means, but we're doing a better job of covering the lives of everybody or trying to, whether you are uh, Black or Hispanic, white, um, uh, whether you are young or old, whether you uh, have disabilities, we we are have a commitment to cover, uh, you know, the, the entirety of America, and I hope we're doing a better job of that. We're never perfect, but hopefully, we're doing better than we were. But what I what I want to say is that um, so I'm not. I don't think there's any such thing as objectivity. On the other hand, I'm not here to give you opinion. If you want opinion, there are hundreds of other places you can turn. You know, turn on your, pick up your smartphone, go to your um, to your favorite cable channel or your favorite uh, blog or 
uh, website and you're going to get you're going to get opinion. It's all over that we're swimming in a sea of opinion right now. But I feel so strongly that uh, I mean, the reason I got into journalism in the first place was to tell um, people what's going on in the world and to try to be as factual as I possibly can be to gather information to make sure the public knows as we're reporting a story that we don't have the whole story yet. We've only, you know, this is just breaking right now. We're telling you what's going on. This is what we know, but also to, to offer analysis uh, on the news hour, the kind of informed analysis that explains the story. Why is this happening? How is it happening? But again, when it gets to controversial things, when it's, you know, how high should my taxes be? Should we have a tax on billionaires? Um, what should government be telling us to do about wearing a mask or getting vaccinated? Um, it's your decision to make. We can try to give you as much information as possible to help you make the right decision. Well, we've got some great questions from listeners coming in, and I do want to remind you to use that Q&A function if you want to ask a question. We'll get to those a little later in the conversation. But you, you've had such an interesting and eventful career, and since we don't have unlimited time, I thought maybe we could do a little bit of a, a lightning round where I'll say a name, you tell me what that person either taught you or meant to you or maybe share an experience with them. And I mean, I said lightning round, take as much time as you'd like <laughs> answering. But uh, the first name I want to ask you about is Pauline Frederick. Oh my goodness, she was one of the first, she was a pioneer. I mean, I think you you or Mosh used the word pioneer referring to me and I do feel like a pioneer, but she truly was a pioneer. She worked for NBC News, uh, maybe another network before that. She covered the United Nations and I would hear her on the radio and then I, or I would see her on TV. I, I remember mainly hearing her on the radio and she had this very authoritative, uh, deep voice. And I, listening to her, I thought, okay, women can do this. And I have to say, the reason I needed that reassurance is because when I started out uh, in, in, in the news world, I was a secretary for the news department of a, uh, a, a TV station in Atlanta. It was the only job I could get right out of, right out of Duke University. And um, I was hired to clean the film, answer the phone, write letters for the news director. That was the job. And I was happy to have it. I was not complaining. Um, but when I applied for a job as a reporter, I was basically told we already have a woman reporter by that station. I was told by multiple radio stations, and this was 19, I wanna say 69. Um, I was told by many, many radio stations around the country, if they even bothered to write me back, we don't think women's voices are authoritative. So this is just a few years later that I'm hearing Pauline Frederick uh, covering this important institution, the United Nations, and it gives me hope. <laughs> that maybe there's a place for me out there somewhere. So she was, she was uh, uh, really, really important. I'm sure not just for me, but for so many other women who went into journalism. Uh, what about Bob Brennan? Oh my gosh, you really did do your research, Brian. He was the news director of the CBS affiliate in Atlanta who hired me to be a reporter. I was a secretary at the ABC affiliate, the news, newsroom secretary. And I'll tell you a secret, in the last six months, uh, well, if you looked at my book, you already know this. In the last six months, I was a secretary. Um, the, the news director there, he knew I was interested in becoming in, in a reporting. And he kept saying to me, we already have a woman reporter. I don't know why you're interested. But he said to me one day, he came up to me one day and he said, well, we've just fired our weekend weather girl. That's what he said. And he said her name. And he said, are you interested in auditioning for that? And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm not. And because um, he knew I wanted to be a, a you know, reporter. Well, he said, well, look, if you're ever going to get any on-air experience, I highly, strongly recommend that you do this. I know you may not be what you want to do, but I, against my will, and because he was urging me to, to do this, I went ahead and tried out. Uh, I thought I was awful, but they hired me to be the Sunday night, 11 p.m. weather girl. So I, it was like Cinderella. During the week, I was there cleaning the film, answering the phone, Monday through Friday. And then I would come in on Sunday night at, at 6 o'clock and go through the weather wires. You know, the, this is back in the day when the UPI and AP tickers came off these big, loud machines. They were just feeding paper constantly and you rip it off. And we had the weather wire that was part of that. And I would pull those, those weather stories and memorize everything that I could. And then I would make notes on this big plexiglass map that was in the back of the newsroom. And then they would come to me at 11, this was the 11 o'clock news. So probably 11.15 or 11.20 into the show. Uh, they would come to me for four or five minutes to talk about, you know, a low over, uh, you know, Dubuque and or the, uh, you know, the high today was in 
was in uh, Houston, Texas or wherever it was. And I had made little tiny notes to myself so I could see what I was saying. I thought I was awful at that, uh, but I did it because I, again, I was told you should do this. And I, uh, long story short, when, when I, I digressed, but after six months, we sort of mutually agreed that this was not my cup of tea. Bob Brennan, who was the news director at the CBS station, uh, called me up and he said, we've lost our reporter covering the state legislature. Would you be interested? I mean, I'd already had conversations with him. And, and he said, I've seen you doing the weather. <laughs> and so um, I said, you have? <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that would kill my chance. But he, um, I went over and he, you know, interview and audition and all that stuff that they, they want you to do. And then he hired me. And in fact, funny, you should ask me, Brian, I spoke with Bob Brennan about a week and a half ago. He's now 93 years old. He lives in Atlanta, um, is still an amazing man. And I just, I was asking him, you know, what, why did you hire me? <laughs> We've had this conversation before. And he said, well, I just thought, you know, you, you had a political science degree from Duke and you'd taken a year of Russian. And I thought, you know, I thought maybe you could cover the Georgia legislature. <laughs> Put two and two together. Yeah, and of course that leads to the Atlanta NBC bureau position, and then eventually they brought you to the White House to cover Jimmy Carter. Um, I, I do want to get to some listener questions, but I want to ask you about one more name, and, and you alluded to her earlier. I hope this is not too painful a topic, but Gwen Ifill. Oh my goodness, um, Gwen, such an icon in American journalism, um, a, a symbol, um, uh, I think for for all women and particularly for women of color. Gwen, uh, her father was a minister and she grew up, you know, they moved a lot when she was growing up. He was, uh, but mainly she grew up in, in the Northeast and she um, tells a story about after she graduated from college and knew she wanted to be a reporter. She had been hired, I think, right out of college at um, Boston Herald. And she, um, the reason I'm sharing this story is because it, I think it, it just begins to tell you just how much courage Gwen had. Um, she'd only been there, I think, a day or two, and somebody left a note on her desk uh, at the Boston Herald. And this would have been in the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken, maybe, maybe the late, actually, maybe the late 70s, um, saying, you know, with a racist, uh, an ugly racist note. And um, she just ignored it. And I think, I'm not even sure she made many comments about it. I think she, told her boss, but said, I'm not bothered by this. And she continued to work there. And then of course the rest is history. She you know, was a star everywhere she went. She ended up working at the, at the New York Times and then NBC News. And then of course she came to PBS to the news hour. And I think 1997, it was during the period I had been at uh, the news hour from 83 till 93. And then I went to work for CNN for a while. Jim Lehrer used to say I was wandering in the wilderness of cable television, cable television. He would ask but you how when, the home shopping network was. That's right. He called, how did you know that? He called it the home shopping network. Um, um, we used to have a good laugh, but Gwen was just um, not only brilliant and um, uh, the kind of person who people gravitate to funny, um, fearless in many ways. I mean, she called them as she saw them. Um, she couldn't stand uh, to see people treated unfairly or to be overlooked. And um, she was just one of some, by the time I came back to the news hour in 2007, I'd been at CNN, left CNN, not, show, not sure what I was gonna do or where I was gonna go, but did a documentary project. And in that process got pulled back into the orbit of the news hour, rejoined in 2007. And Gwen and I were colleagues. I mean, I knew her as, as a friend, but didn't. But we hadn't been close friends. We became very good friends and then um, as I said, after Jim Lehrer retired, he eventually named us in 2013. And we decided early on that we were going to be, you know, inseparable in terms of co-anchors that, you know, we, there'd be a lot of talk and gossip about they must be feuding. It's the, you know, the story about women can't get along with each other. And that was never the case with us. We, I had her back. She had my back. Um, I was always, um, you know, I was cheering for her and everything that she did and losing her. Uh, in 2016, uh, at the end of the year, right after the election, uh, was was devastating for all of us. Um, but she, you know, her legacy, her her message lives on with the news hour and, and everything we do. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I, Washington Week was always appointment viewing for me. I only knew her as a viewer. I was 
basked in her glow she, when she and I were both covering the uh, an, a presidential campaign announcement of a senator from Illinois on a very cold February morning in 2017. I happened to be standing right next to her as she was filing her reports for the news hour, I presume. Was, um, that, but, was that Paul Salman? Paul Simon? No, no, no. No, uh, <laughs> sorry, 2007, uh, Barack Obama. Oh, of course. <laughs> a very, a very cold you. February I morning. I was going in, back earlier. Yeah, in Springfield, Illinois. This is a good segue, though, because you were not supposed to be a solo anchor. And we've had between the Trump administration and the COVID-19 pandemic, the pace of news has been relentless for going on six years now. And that that brings us to our first listener question, which is from Ruth in Champaign, who asks, how do you keep yourself recharged in the face of delivering often grim news day after day? Ruth, that's such a good question. Um, And I have to ask myself that. Uh, frankly, uh, every once in a while, because the news has been relentlessly hard. We had a hard fought election in 2016. The country was very divided. And of course, during the next four years, uh, during the Trump presidency, the country was very politically divided. Uh, We had a president who was um, regularly uh, belittling and and worse uh, in his attitude toward the press, calling us enemies of the American people. Um, In my view, nothing could be further from the truth. But that was uh, how he saw it. And I guess he said the other day, he's repeated it, continues to believe that. Um, that Then along came COVID at the beginning of 2020 um, and, and just turmoil in so much of our lives. Um, I, I, all I can tell you is that I believe, number one, I am backed up by the most phenomenal news organization, the, the PBS NewsHour team. You don't see most of them on the air every day, but from the top to the bottom, from our executive producer, Sarah Just, to our team of correspondents, and they've grown over the years. You see them on, now on the air every night. There are, what, nine, 10 of them. And then there are those who, like Paul Salman, who covers uh, economics, or Jeff Brown, Jeffrey Brown, who covers the arts and for us. I mean, we have just an extraordinary team um, from Amna Nawaz to, to uh, Lisa Desjardins, William Brangham, and I, I'm leaving somebody out, John Yang, and, and, and on down the list. They're all just fabulous. So them, and then a whole layer of producers and associate producers and other folks who, who just make the place um, the, the amazing machine that it is. And I mean a machine with a heart, uh, because we are still like a family. We're, we've grown bigger. We I think we now have over 150 employees, but, we, but compared to the, the major commercial television news networks, we are, we're much, much smaller. And we still think of ourselves uh, as a family. So I'm, that's the first thing is I'm backed up by this amazing team and I know they have my back. I certainly uh, try to have theirs. Um, and the other thing is that I just, I'm am determined that um, we're gonna get the job done every day, that no matter what the news is, no matter how terrible it is, it's like the day I had to tell our audience that Gwen had died, there was another day uh, in 2020, when I had to tell the people that Jim Lehrer had died that day, um, whether it's the worst of the COVID stories or the Ukraine stories we've been covering for the last month, um, so much of this is absolutely heartbreaking, but I'm committed to my job. I, I just, I think it's really important that people know they can count on the news hour uh, for the information that they need. And, and it's, it's what, it's the reason I get up every morning. Well, since you brought up the team at the news hour, we had another question from Nick in Crawfordsville, Indiana, who said, who wondered how many millennial or Generation Z staffers work on the news hour, and if you could talk about how their perspectives influence their older coworkers. You know, I wish I had a count, but I think they are clearly more than half of us. <laughs> um, they're all uh, considerably younger than I am. You can imagine if I've been doing this for fifty years, um, you can you can do the math. A lot, many of them are in their. We 20s. stay the same age. The producers keep getting younger. That's right. Uh, many of them are in their 20s. They're just a few years out of college or just out of college. But, 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 but many of them also have worked in other news organizations and they bring their talent to the news hour and they, you know, they're working with us in editing, in, putting, in working with us in social media. We have now, I think just the other day, we surpassed 3 million YouTube, I think this is right, uh, viewers. Um, I, I may not have it exactly right, but we put enormous emphasis on under the leadership of our, our executive producer, Sarah Just, on expanding our, our social media and online presence. So the online news hour is every bit as important to us as the television news hour. Um, and we are, we are available all the time, YouTube, 
uh, online. And then in addition to that, we are, have a, a robust Facebook presence, Twitter, Instagram, and we're just starting, I can tell you a secret TikTok in the next few days. So, um, you know, there was a time, I think, when the news hour thought, gee, you know, we don't need to go there. That was probably a decade ago, but it's pretty clear today that you cannot reach the younger generation and where they are, which is what we, our mission is to go where you are to bring you the news. And if you're getting your news through um, one of these other form, formats, platforms, we want to be there for it. And so um, that's many of the young people we've hired are, are just brilliant in coming up with creative ways to tell important stories. Um, and, the, and I distinguish between what we're doing and what I see other some other organizations doing, which are, it's, it's all about celebrities or, you know, your favorite cat. And I love cats and dogs too. And don't get me wrong. I love all those animal stories. But there's a, there's a, there's a meaning, there's a story, there's a real story there behind the kind of reporting that you see with the news. You're going to learn something every time you see a piece we do on TikTok or Instagram or one of, one of these other platforms. Um, and of course the, the, the central mission of the news hour is to tell you the most important things that happened that day. We're going to find ways to tell you those things um, on several different platforms and in different ways. But one way or another, we're going to get it across and we're going to find you where you are. Um, and and that's, that's what drives us. And the young people are the ones who are driving that. I mean, they are so smart. They all care about journalism. And there was a time not so long ago, Brian, when I worried that the press was under so much um, more than scrutiny, just distrust. And that, that still is an issue in this country. There's a serious lingering distrust of the news media. And we have to work hard every day to earn that, to earn the trust that we have and to earn back the trust of those individuals, Americans who, who've just given up on, on uh, the media. We have to work hard to earn that, earn their trust, earn their confidence. And, um, and in order to do that, um, we can't flag. I mean, we can't, give up, get discouraged. And these young people get that. I mean, they, they care about journalism, the kind of journalism that Jim and Robin started back in 1975. It may be coming out, it may be formatted differently, but the purpose is still there. Well, I'm now really excited to see what the news hour does on TikTok. Um, Me too. I can't wait. <laughs> this does bring up a question that Robin from Urbana asked about news gathering in this era of social media and the, the internet, well, I'd say the internet, we've been in the internet era for a generation now, but um, it's easier for reporters to get information, the accuracy of which is challenging to verify on the fly. That was not a very well constructed sentence, but I think you know what I'm getting at. For news consumers, she wants, she or he wants to know if you have any tips on how to consume news in a way that one can get objective news accounts in this era of information overload, maybe. I think, I'm sorry, what was her name? Uh, I don't know if it's a her or him, but it's somebody, Robin, from Urbana. Oh, oh, Robin, that's right. Thank you very much. Robin, um, this is something I wrestle with a lot. What I generally believe is true is that if you look, if somebody sends you something, either on Facebook or email, or they text you something, a link, look at the source. Is this a source that you recognize? Is this the Associated Press, which is a highly reputable news organization? Is it the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post? the PBS NewsHour, NBC, CBS, uh, ABC, CNN, Fox, go down the list. Are those organizations you trust? Ask yourself if that source, if you can believe it, and yet sometimes you have to look closely because it may look like one thing, and the, but it may not be that. But if, if, you, if you know the source, ask yourself, is that the source that, I'm, that I can be confident? Reuters, another wire service, or one of the, one of the international news organizations. Right now, I mean, I, um, I see BBC reporting uh, that I place a lot of confidence in. And some of the European news organizations, especially during the war in Ukraine, are doing some excellent reporting out of, uh, out of the war zone. Um, if, it, if, it's, if it's a piece of, if it's a, an article that doesn't say who wrote it or you don't recognize where it came from, then you want to be skeptical. What's happened today is that the burden of of figuring out whether the news we get is trustworthy 
now falls more on, on our shoulder, your shoulder as news consumers. It used to be you could pretty much count on I don't know, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, I'll name them again. Um, uh, you know, whatever your principal newspaper is in Champaign, Urbana, um, you could count on those news organizations. You knew them, you might not always agree with their editorial page, but you pretty much believed in their reporting. Um, today, there's just news, there's flotsam and jetsam coming at us from every direction. And we have to do work really hard sometimes to figure out if what we're hearing is true. I mean, we are doing that all day long at the news hour tonight, uh, or, or I don't know, today I'm trying to think there was a story. We're always seeing stories that pop up on the wires, on Twitter. I didn't mention, I should spend more time talking about Twitter because it's become virtually a, a, um, a visual wires, wire service for us. Reporters use it a lot. If a story pops up, how do we know it's true? Even if somebody you trust is reporting it, look again and see what, what's the provenance of it. Where did it come from? Um, and so just take a little extra time. Uh, that's what we all have to do. We have to do that too. We have a, a question from a student journalist. Allison is a senior at the University of Illinois and asks, uh, over your career, have your methods for building respect with your sources and audience changed over time? You've talked a lot about the audience. What about sources? Has that changed in Washington in your career? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that question, Allison. So uh, kudos to you for coming up with, a, with an original question. I, I think what I would say is that over time and with experience, I want to believe that I have better judgment about who to believe. There were a lot of mistakes I made early in my career. People would tell me things and I would assume because I thought that person was in a position to know that, that I could report that. Um, and of course, I, I found out with experience. You have to remember, I never studied journalism. I never took a course. I had to learn on the fly. I learned from colleagues um, and I learned very much by trial and error. Um, but I think over time, I've learned to take everything with a grain of salt, to know that always to think about um, where is this information coming from? Where, if it's, if it's not a document that is pretty neutral and it's coming from a person, what is that person's um, uh, attitude here? I mean, what do, they, what do they want the outcome to be? Do they have skin in this game? Do they want, you know, do they, if they have a strong interest in the story being told a certain way, then I'm going to take what they say with some, let's say, a grain of salt, um, and remember that that may be only half the story. I may come to find out that they're giving me the exact straight scoop after I've checked it out with other people. But I think with experience, I think these fifty some years of doing this has given me um, uh, it's given me a, a the ability to uh, to not rush to judgment and to um, to to weigh what I hear and what I read and what I'm told um, based on, you know, who's saying it and what the circumstances are. Um, I think some reporters get that more quickly than others. Um, I think I'm, I'd like to think I'm better at it today, but it's not to say I haven't, haven't made mistakes. People have told me things that turned out not to be the, not to be the case. And um, you learn from that. The people who burn you, as we, the expression we use in journalism, um, you learn not to trust them again. Just, I know we're coming to the end of our hour. I want to get a few more questions from uh, some of our uh, listeners in. Sean from Bloomington asks, to the extent it's ever typical, can you describe a, a typical day in the life of a PBS news reporter? And uh, maybe you can talk about an anchor. I don't know if you want to start from the morning alarm clock or when you walk into the <laughs> PBS Global News headquarters uh, to, <laughs> to airtime. Well, I'll describe a typical day. Now, you have to remember my day is going to be different from those of the correspondents who may be out today. I mean, during the pandemic, everybody was working from home. But now we are starting to be out doing more interviews. You see that in the stories that we air on the show. As the anchor, my role is different. I'm not traveling uh, very much at all. I'll start to travel in coming weeks, but I haven't been traveling very much at all during the pandemic. I get up three mornings a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I get up really early, just a little after six. I work out for a while. Uh, then I get dressed for the day. We have our morning meeting uh, at nine o'clock Eastern. It can run anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half, depending on how much news we have, how many questions arise during this call that can involve anywhere from 60 to 90 people, 
depending on who's able to participate in the call that day. And we, Sarah, just who I mentioned before, executive producer, believes in the more brains involved in thinking about the program, the better off we are. And I absolutely agree with her. Um, it wasn't the way the news hour used to function in the back in the day. It was pretty much a top-down decision. In the early days, Jim and Robin made the decision, would listen to everybody and make the decision today. I mean, we still, Sarah and I are the, are the decision makers. She's the executive producer. I'm the managing editor. Uh, but we get input from a lot of people and we have open discussion about the kind of story. For example, we had a long conversation on Monday after the Oscars about how to cover the Will Smith, um, Chris Rock uh, situation and what was the bet. We ultimately decided to, to use a, uh, two report, different reporters um, and we're going we're gonna to do another follow up segment on that tomorrow night. But, but so there's that, that call. And then from that call, we, we come up with a plan or how we're going to map out that night's show. We have a producer who literally lines up the show. But then between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., 100 things can happen. News is breaking. Uh, a guest you wanted isn't available. A guest you didn't think was available is available. Some other story happens. A piece that you thought was ready isn't ready. So many things can happen. And so we're changing. We're in touch all day. Uh, I'm on the phone. I'm reading. I'm talking to colleagues. I'm working in my right here in my, in my home study. Uh, I am, uh, like I said, on the phone using email, using text, using some Zoom. We call it Microsoft Teams. That's the other way we talk to each other, um, sort of shaping the show. And then at some point in the afternoon, depending on what my responsibilities are, that day. for example, two days ago, I interviewed the prime minister of Estonia. I interviewed her from this room via Skype from, uh, from a computer just like this sitting here with this background. And then I went into the office a few hours, and actually 10 o'clock in the morning, I interviewed her. I went into the office at four o'clock. I interviewed uh, Congressman Adam Schiff, who's on the January 6th committee. Um, and so, th but that day, today, I ended up just basically introducing the stories that other people did. So it's different. I get out, I go to the studio, say two, three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm live on the air from six to seven. I leave the studio in Arlington, Virginia at seven. I get home at 7.30. So here I am. I was here just in time to join you tonight. Well, thank you for that. It sounds like a, a packed day. Uh, let's see if we can get another student question in here. Um, where did it go? Uh, I'm going to pivot. This is not a student question, but Jeff from Springfield asks, of all the presidents you've covered, which one did you find had the best sense of humor? Very good. Um, let me think about that. I mean, they all had kind of a sense of humor. Um, certainly, I mean, I'm thinking back to um, yeah, I'm thinking, I would say maybe, um, maybe Barack Obama. I mean, he, you know, was, he, he would, I just, not because I covered it, I wasn't covering the White House then, but whenever I was in a situation where I was able to ask him questions, he was very, he likes to sort of, um, tweak the press, if you will. I mean, he's, he's very fond of kind of lightly making fun of the situation that you're in. Um, I think, you know, I think President George W. Bush had a good sense of humor. I mean, he believed, you know, he also liked to sort of tweak reporters sometimes. So I'd say maybe both of them. I'll, I'll give them, I'll give them the best rating for sense of humor. Another student question from Maggie, uh, another journalism major, who says, over the years with your experience in political reporting, how have you seen things change? Um, and, and she lists a couple of different areas. I'm going to pick access to public officials. How has that changed? Uh, it's changed enormously because number one, for security reasons, there's so many more. It's what, going back to your earlier question, Ryan, about you know, how politics has changed. It's so polarized. And after January the 6th, even access to the United States Capitol, it was already very secure and hard to get in. Now it's much, much harder. Even the White House, of course, when I first covered the White House and President Carter, Pennsylvania Avenue was open. We would walk down the street, um, you know, you still had to go through security to get onto the White House grounds, but today the entire block in front of the White House is completely cordoned off, big block, concrete blockades, nobody can come in in a car. Um, so it's, it's harder to, to reach people. Um, and I think, frankly, people are just more wary. I think with, with um, maybe it's because we're all surrounded by press, by, by different forms of press, Politicians today, to me, are much more careful about what they say. They, they 
you know, they know you're, um, you know, you're a reporter and they're either going to say, okay, this is off the record. I can talk to you, but this is off the record. Or um, they'll just say, look, I can't, you know, I just can't talk, can't talk to you. Not to say they never do. And sometimes they do want to talk and they do want to get something across. But I would say they're much more sophisticated today about, for better or for worse, about talking to us. And the other thing I'll say is that, you know, there are many more media uh, uh, consultants out there. Um, more politicians have what we call media training, where if you're running for Congress or you're running for any significant political office, you can hire somebody to tell you how to, frankly, duck questions. Um, and you know, uh, that, That's a great question, but what I think the American people really care about is X, Y, Z. Exactly. That's exactly what they do. They'll, Judy, you know, that was, that was I'm so glad you asked that. And let me tell you this which would be a completely different subject. Um, and, and they're good at it. And you just have to, you know, we've all had to be very persistent to just come back and ask the same darn question again or find another way to, to come at them. Bless their little hearts. <laughs> yes, I sometimes share with students a BBC a questioner who asked the same question, I think it was 13 or 15 times, and I'm sure you've seen the clip it's from some years I ago. haven't, but I, I oh. identify with that. Yeah, when, yeah. You know, and, and when I've asked somebody a question four times, I think the most I've ever done it was maybe four times, five times. You know, some people don't like, you know, the audience sometimes will be with you if they think, you know, you're trying to get at it, but sometimes they'll say, wait a minute, why did you just keep asking the same question over and over again? And it, it has to be something that you think is important uh, that you're going to keep, keep at keep after. Another question, I think it's it's related to that somewhat. Hakan from Normal says, what types of stories or topics does the NewsHour team have the hardest time setting the tone or choosing their words? Very interesting. I would say one of the things that has, has made a huge difference for us in the last few years has been in the aftermath of the George Floyd killing, um, murder. Um, our strong desire to cover stories around race in America and to do it in a way that's respectful and not hyperventilating, stories that provide light and not heat. Uh, and, uh, and, and as you can imagine, as everybody I think watching and listening knows, uh, there are a lot of sensitivities there, uh, particularly when you're talking about the disputes between uh, police and how police handle um, many uh, crimes and people they perceive to have committed a crime, how the, how the black community in this country perceives that they are treated by police. Um, we've, we've had a lot of conversation, hours and hours of conversation among us on the news hour about how to report these stories. And it's really important to us to go to these stories. We think it's our obligation. If, if a story, if something is going on in the, in the minds and the hearts of the American people, then we want to go there. We want to, we want to talk about it. And, and how do we talk about it in a way that's respectful? Um, and it's just, it's something that's really important to us. And, and you could say the same thing in some ways. I mean, just recently, there've been a number of stories, as you know, about LGBTQ rights. A number of states are changing laws with regard to transgender youth. And uh, just the state of Florida, just this week passed a law and covering those stories, talking about those issues in a very, very politically polarized time is challenging. But we are committed to go there. We are, if it's, if it's happening, if it's a law that's changing, if people's lives are affected, we wanna go there. We wanna, we wanna hear what people are saying, what they think, why they think so, and we wanna bring the facts uh, to, the, to our audience so people can make up their own minds. Uh, just, a, I will share a comment from another listener. Alexander says, my mother wrote to Judy's assistant and requested an autographed headshot for me for my birthday last year, and she did it. Uh, wanted to know how you had time in your schedule to do that. Thank you, Judy. It was one of the most thoughtful presents I ever received. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad. Happy birthday. <laughs> um, another student question. Uh, Sydney uh, from Urbana, journalism student at U of I. Big fan of the PBS NewsHour since I was very young. I wonder if Judy might have any advice for students like me that look forward to working as a journalist. My advice is to, I don't know at what stage you are in your education, but is to read as much as you can, uh, absorb as much history as you, if you want to be a reporter, absorb as much history as you can, soak it all up, understand as much about American history, world history, because 
that's the context that you'll need to have as you go out there and you cover whether it's legal issues or political issues or economic issues or whatever it is. Um, yeah, yes, it's different. I mean, if you decide that you're going to cover the arts, um, but I still think if you're covering the arts, you're going to be talking to writers and artists who are thinking about the, the context of this country and where the American people are and where the um, where hearts and minds are at this moment. And so you need to understand where we are as an American people, where we fit in the in the river of, of life and the river of you know as history unfolds. So that's my advice to young people. If they if you want to go into reporting, uh, first of all, you have to be curious. If you've got the curiosity, bless you, you're going to need that and it'll take you a long way. But learn as much as you can about this country because that is going to provide the backdrop for every every bit of work. So much, I should say, so much of the work that you do as a reporter. Well, Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour, thank you so much for doing what you do and the team for doing what they do and for spending your evening with us tonight. We really appreciate it. It is my honor, Brian. I thoroughly enjoyed your questions and the questions from folks who are watching. And I just want to say happy 100th again to WILL. Congratulations on the amazing work that you all do, um, holding the banner high for public media in uh, in Illinois. We uh, it is just so important. Public media to me, it's close to my heart. It's um, it's 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 a calling. And um, I, I just want to celebrate with all of you. It's an honor to be with you. Well, thank you again. It's a virtual environment, so you can't hear the applause, but I'm sure in living rooms and, and offices across central Illinois, people are applauding for you. So thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.